Hey, it, hey, it's Jay again. You're going to be seeing a lot of me in these later videos, so get used to it. And today we're going to be talking about the angle constraint. Alright, so today we're going to be learning about the angle constraint in Autodesk Inventor. Now, the first thing you're going to need to know about that is where to find it. So to do that, you're going to make sure you're in the Assemble tab, and then you're going to go to the Constraints menu, and it's going to open this little window, and it's second from the left. That This is the angle constraint. And it looks like two beams at an angle, quite intuitively. So then, to show you how to use it, I've actually got to do a quick thing. It's doing that. Like We're going to use the insert constraint like we learned about last video. Then we're going to align those holes. Then we're going to ground this so that it can't move at all. And now you can see uh, that the this beam can rotate around that hole freely as it wants. So that's great, but this can move freely, which is not a thing you usually want because that leaves degrees of freedom. So here's where the angle constraint comes in. It has three modes about it. There's directed and und undirected and explicit reference vector. To be totally honest, there's only one difference that I really know about these two. I'm sure there's more, but that's all I know and we'll get to it when we get to it. So first of all, we use directed angle, and you can, what you can use that for is you can select two like lines or faces, and then it can just you can select what angle they go at. So for example, this is zero; it goes up to 180. You can do that. You could also give it an angle, which is, we could also do that with like mate and flush, though. That's not that special. But where it comes in fancy is where you can do things like oh, let's go for a 45 degree angle. And now it forms a 45. And now you can go negative 45 and it'll go the other direction. And that's great. That's very fancy and useful. And undirected angle behaves in a very much the same way. The only real use I have for that is when you're applying limits, which is a completely different video that we're talking about later. But these are but this is usually the one you're gonna want to use. Now the other one that's useful is the explicit reference vector angle. What that will do is it allows you to align them or make them at an angle along a given angle, which is a given line, which is great. Now, I actually don't know what you have to select because these are three different things. So we're just going to try this. Actually, no, we're going to try this. It's an outside angle because hopefully what happens here so that I can make these two things. No, that did a weird thing. <laughs> okay, so basically what it would do is it would be, this picture is very self-explanatory. You give it like a line and it will, and then you can select two faces, and then it'll make them at that angle with respect to that line. Now this is great and useful, especially with stuff like gussets, because then you can make the thing, the beams go at an angle that the gusset is, and you can put the gusset on there, and it fits all nicely. And one fancy thing about this specific constraint is these pictures are pretty self-explanatory and great, so use that to your advantage, because it's there, you may as well. We're hoping that goes back. Yes, it does. Good, good, good. Um, now that's back to being nice and rotating, and the use cases for this constraint is kind of honestly making an angle between two components for like a gusset or just you want these to cross a specific angle. However, there is a nice way that I quite like is you can use it to align two faces in a less clunky way than like the flush constraint because it allows you to move them up and down if you want to. So we could like go ahead and make these and then give them an angle of zero and you can see these are now aligned and that's what we want we can do the same thing with these faces and then if we go ahead and delete this insert you can see that this will slide up and this will not rotate because it has to be at a zero degree angle to all of those so that's a way to just remove degrees of rotational degrees of freedom without removing translational degrees of freedom, which is a useful thing. So 
The one big thing you gotta be careful of with this constraint though, is you want to make sure you, usually you're gonna use directed, at least that's usually what I do, but it defaults to the explicit reference vector option, which is less than ideal because that's not usually what you want. So you just gotta make sure you manually go to select that. Oh, one more thing I almost forgot about is this button. Basically what this will do is, if I go ahead and resume that to what it was, um, what this button will do is when you go to constrain them, if, you ch if this button's checked, it will predict the angle that they're at right now, so you can like kind of go to 45, and see I selected express a reference vector there, which is not what's good, but that was zero. But basically if it's like way over here, it should default to something that is not, see, um, not zero. See, that's 55.76 degrees, which you don't usually want, but then you can go in and you know what direction you have to go now, and it's sometimes easier just to do that. And then we can make it go up to 45. And that's the angle constraint. Good job. You know how to use that now. See you in the next one.